Hey, Chuck. Uh, my name is Jason here at Multiculti. It's nice, nice to meet you. Nice right. to meet you, too. So, um, oh, where did you start in the financial sector? Uh, I mean, what is your uh, background uh, uh, during during uh, 2008, uh, like like before 2008, and then and then what happened uh, after that? What what did you what did you discover? What did you notice that you just learned from that experience? Um. find a house you want to buy to see if you can get a loan for the house. And um, I was 19, didn't, didn't have a license uh, to be doing this. It wasn't required at the time, virtually no regulation. And uh, I made really good money. Um, as far as when I, when did I, I don't know quite when I caught on. I think just uh, working in that industry and over I mean, you're blinded by the fact that you get paid a lot of money to make these loans, but after you've been doing it for a while, you start to actually examine the terms of these loans and the papers you're having. Uh, people sign, and you realize you're kind of setting them up to fail. I mean, there were loans that, uh, if you had a good credit score, you could lie about your income. If you had a good enough credit score, you could lie about your income, your assets, and whether or not you had a job. We called those uh, dope dealer loans. <laughs> as long as you had a credit score and money, you could get you know whatever you wanted. And we encourage people to buy buy houses and we encourage people to refinance when it wasn't necessary, so that we could make our commission. Maybe start them off at a higher rate, so we could step them down over a couple of refinances. Then you learn how mortgages are paid back, um, amortization, and how banks make all their money up front. And the interest is front loaded. How, how, how did you get your start uh, in this business? Uh, did you get formally educated, or no? Did you just... No, I, I didn't even graduate high school, so um, I was uh, interested. You know, I was looking for ways to make money. I had kids young, so I was looking for ways to support myself and my family. And um, started. I saw a couple late night uh, infomercials on real estate, and I became interested in the topic. And started doing some research. My girlfriend's friend's boyfriend, I had a random discussion with him. He was looking into moving in the area. I was asking about rental prices. I told him he should buy a house because mortgage rates were really low. And started telling him a little bit about what I had learned. Turned out that he worked for a mortgage brokerage, so he had me come down. I interviewed and got the job the next day. So what happened uh, in, in 2008? It's, it's, it's kind of hard to... Uh, Sum it up as far as uh, what uh, the what? housing bubble yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, it's really a number of factors. I mean, it starts it starts with the monetary policy set by the government. The Federal Reserve sets the interest rates low to encourage growth. Um, yeah, at what point did you wake up? What was the red flag for you that said something something's not right? Uh, option arms. It's a uh, type of loan where you have the option of making a, an interest only payment, a full payment, or a, a minimum payment, in which case the balance of the payment is tacked on to the end of your loan amount. I mean, they assume that real estate's always going to appreciate. So uh, people usually don't think that far ahead though, so I could call people and just say, hey, I can cut your payment from $1,200 to $760 you know, when you want to come in. and. Um, just the exorbitant amount that people paid for these loans. Uh, I mean, I, that was the first red flag. That, that it just seemed like the the riskier the loan. You know, this is a risky loan here. You know, you're, you're allowing people to increase their loan balance instead of slowly pay it off. It's like a minute, making a minimum payment on a credit card. So, uh, what are the risks involved with with that type of uh, um, refinancing? Is, is that correct? That's mm -hmm. the refinancing? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, what are the, the risks to the consumer and what are the risks to the institution? Well, much like a credit card, well, for the institution it's risky because um, they're also banking on the appreciation of real estate. You know, real estate was appreciating very quickly, um, so it was difficult. It's in bubbles just like tulips and all of that, and I don't, the banks apparently didn't see it. Um, 
for, for a person, for an individual or a family buying a house, uh, the risk is just like a credit card. I mean, you can run up your credit cards, you can make minimum payments, but eventually that balance has to be paid off. And the way these loans are structured after a number of years, um, you have to make the full payment. They don't let you make the minimum payment forever. So a lot of people assuming that their house was going to appreciate and assuming that their financial situation was secure and they'd be able to finance took these loans which allowed them to make a small initial payment. Then over a period of three or five years, depending on the structure of the loan, the payments graduated to a payment that was probably higher than the payment they were originally making. Now the assumption was that they'd be able to refinance if their house had appreciated. After enough of these bad loans got out there and people started to you know, come wake up to the fact that this uh, trend couldn't continue, that it was just tulip mania all over again, houses started losing value, the house sales plummeted, um, people started, you know, these loans started jumping up and adjusting. And um, all of a sudden people had a lot more money to pay, some had been laid off, uh, or they just anticipated being able to refinance. They went to refinance. The value of their home had not appreciated as they thought. Their ratio of the amount owed to the value of their home wasn't, was no longer high enough for them to be able to obtain uh, favorable financing. So was, now they're stuck with a payment they can't afford. Was this type of situation, this predicament, uh, do you think this was uh just uh, oversight, or do you think it was orchestrated somehow? Mm, it's easier to prove incompetence than malice, but I, I... It's hard to say. Really, it is hard to say. Uh, I would tend to think that it was orchestrated as a way to uh, expropriate you know, large amounts of um, land resources Who from individuals. It? If that's the case, uh, who are the manufacturers of this? Who's, who's, who's benefiting from this crisis? It's hard to point specific fingers, but um, anyone that worked for a large bank, or, or especially the, uh, even the banks that failed, the executive boards, or banks that received bailout money after the, the, um, the crash. I mean, if you think about it this way, I mean, people took out loans for houses that they probably shouldn't have bought. And in doing so, banks made loans to these people that they probably shouldn't have made. So both took on risk. Now, the situation I just explained with the graduated payments, being stuck in a home you can't afford, houses, house prices drop and you're unable to finance. The bank comes in and repossesses your house and then they take your tax money to write off their losses. Uh, so the corporations got bailed out after that. And now they're, now they're sitting on a bunch of uh, non-performing assets, which, you know, they, they say is bad, but they receive money for all that. They're not hurting, and now they have a whole bunch of other stuff to sell. Um, what, what was the argument for why they should receive the money? What, what, what did the media and the government and the corporations uh, uh, use to justify that the bank should be bailed out? It's the too-big-to-fail argument. Uh, same argument that auto manufacturers use, same argument that Chrysler used in 1981. We employ X amount of people, uh, you know, you, you eliminate, uh, if you allow us to fail, all those jobs will be eliminated, all those people will no longer have purchasing power, other industries will suffer. Um, financial institutions are very interconnected, they have a lot of loans to each other, they do a lot of overnight loans to one another to cover losses. And, buy each other's uh, securities and assets and stuff. So, I mean, the, the, the idea is that if one bank is allowed to fail, it can cause a cascading effect in, in the financial world. Or if, uh, if a manufacturing institution is allowed to fail, it can cause a rippling effect with unemployment and personal purchasing power. E e either, uh, in either case, it's, uh, it's a threat of looming Armageddon. If we're allowed to fail, you know, then it's just going to spread ever-widening circles of... Uh, economic decay. It doesn't seem to be the case though. No, it's not. And, and can you elaborate that, on that? It kind of violates one of the basic premises of capitalism, you know, or, or a capitalism free market mindset, which is a concept of creative destruction. The idea is when a firm doesn't adapt quickly to market conditions or makes too many mistakes or isn't able, you know, they take on too much risk, they fail. And all of a sudden, instead of having a, a large amount of unemployed people, you have a large window of opportunity for other entrepreneurs with, they can run a tighter ship, a more efficient uh, operation. Um, 
to come in, and that's creative destruction. You know, like you said, it opens up a market for other people to innovate. Um, if anything, you know, that's the best thing. You know, it's one of the best features of capitalism is that it, it favors efficiency and favors you know, bringing mark up products to market that are you know of quality and produce as cheaply as possible um, uh, the uh, housing of the uh, the, uh, the housing committee uh, part of the occupy movement they are making an argument that there's more houses that are um, not occupied than there are homeless people uh, and they're making the argument that there should be some something done about that where they could maintain housing in these places without um, the responsibility, so to speak, uh, or the responsibility that they can't make at this point. Where do you see uh, a solution going, either, either this way or, or, or another way? What do you think is the best, best approach, uh, or a a solution, a solution yeah. to the shadow inventory of housing or yeah. homelessness or maybe both well well both because they're they're both they both could be related I mean, yeah they're they're, both part of the i mean as far as homelessness goes I mean, yeah, housing the homeless is more efficient than leaving them on the streets most people don't recognize the externalities of leaving people on the streets they get sick they go to the hospital, you know, much more frequently than your average citizen. It actually, drives up the price of health care for um, you know, your average average Joe. So it makes it makes economic sense to do something like that. But then, you know, the, the question always comes out: Who's going to foot the bill? And I don't I don't think because it because it seems distasteful to give uh, a handout, you know, right. so to speak. Well, the, well, the argument with the handouts is that if you give somebody a handout, that they're going to be dependent on it. It's disincentive so, to work, right? Yeah, exactly. there's there's people that are incapable of working as well. There's people that, especially with minimum wage laws, I mean, there are people that might not, because of their incapacity, might not be worth eight dollars and fifty cents an hour. Might make sense to let them work. Well, those 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 people hopefully fall in the net of disability, uh, and and there's a whole issue with disability too. That's for another argument, uh, but we're focusing on the people that lost their homes because they fell into the trap yeah. of the housing market. Yeah. I don't know where I stand on that. You know, some of me thinks, oh, now you gotta rent. You know, that sucks. I don't know where the solution is to that because there is there is a there is merit to saying that you know just giving these giving people a handout or giving them a, a mulligan or a do-over um, is a disincentive to uh, to work or a disincentive to, to practice on prudent finance in your uh, financial house, but. I would pref much prefer that to what happened, which is we did we basically gave the same disincentive to be efficient, disincentive towards responsibility to those corporations by bailing them out. So if I had to choose between corporations or people to bail out, I would have much rather forgiven the debt on the home loan somehow and had uh, the Federal Reserve pay for that rather than bailing out the companies. Um, How has this situation affected your livelihood? Because you were you were the mortgage broker that was actually actually involved in putting these people in these traps, not being aware that they were traps. You were just kind of going along with the system like everybody else. I mean, I was I was young and also blinded by the money. When you're making, it's like Boiler Room. You've seen that movie? I've heard of it. Yeah. Well, they they run a just a con a con operation. It's a stock operation, but it's um it's bogus and. The guy catches on to what he was doing, and uh, or what's going on, how the company operates, and he's no longer really able to uh, to do the job. That's sort of what happened to me. That's how it affected my livelihood. Once I figured out that I was setting people up to fail, I couldn't make a convincing sale. I didn't even want to make a sales call. You know, they they tell you your house is your biggest investment. It's not really an investment in the same sense that buying a stock is an investment. There's a whole kind of uh, mythology and myth-making business that goes along with the home ownership thing and then, you know, push people into the home, the, the American dream, the sense of pride, you know, you, so you feel proud about what you do and then you learn the reality of what's actually going on, the long-term consequences of the uh, contracts you're putting people into. I just couldn't do the work anymore. So, I mean, 
mean, I had to get out and get into a different industry. Wow. Well, thank you, Chuck. I think that explains a lot very concisely. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think uh, a multicultural collective and the public that sees this, these videos uh, would uh, get a lot out of out of what you described here. It's pretty universal. It's unbiased for the most part. Yeah, I, I mean, you're looking at all sides, and I think I think more that type of um, more of the type of output is what people are looking for. I think education is the important key. That's 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 how I would answer. And I, thanks for. I appreciate that, but uh, I also think that uh, education is the uh, the real solution to the problem. People, and, people and, don't. And how could people attain that education? What are the, what are the resources that, or what are the avenues? For, because the resources, there are a lot of resources out there. What are the avenues? You're not going to get it in school. <laughs> yeah, right. So yeah, I took uh, I took economics in high school, and it was more of a bookkeeping class, you know, to tell, teach me how to balance my checkbook. Doesn't really have anything to do with economics. Study economics a little bit on your own. I really, you know, I Henry Hazlitt economics in one lesson. Uh, Friedrich Hayek, the, the Road to Serfdom. You know, Austrian school economics. Rich Dad Poor Dad. It's a popular. Uh, you know, just do what you can to increase your financial literacy and to gain an understanding of how these uh, systems work and function. And you know, then you'll know how to spot uh, a raw deal. When, when it's put in front of you. And differentiate that from a, from a fraudy. From a, yeah, fraudulent, you know, then, then you can, or, or fraudulent or, let's say, misguided. Un unduly risky. Yeah, misguided, unduly risky. You know, you, you'll be able to analyze what's in front of you and t determine whether it's a sound investment or not. Or, you know, or what you're signing, at the loan terms, if, you, if, if they're realistic. And you need to be realistic with yourself as well maybe realize that the 4,800 square foot house isn't for everybody and it was never really meant to be. The American dream was an 1,800 square foot house or a 1,200 square foot house. If you've seen post-war houses that went up to a house of GIs and chicken in every pot, you know, that whole, uh, it's kind of been inflated now with the materialism. People need to temper, temper their uh, expectations and realize what money actually does buy, you know, realize that nothing ever goes up forever, whatever goes up must come down, um, and give yourself a basic financial education, learn how money works, and learn how loans work, and learn how banks work, and, I mean, it's a, it, it's a lot of responsibility, but, uh, if you don't protect your rights, you don't have the right to, uh, enjoy them and uh, that seems to be the forefront of democracy and liberty and freedom is that we have to be able to stand up to protect them otherwise they'll you have to be vigilant uh, it's like I mean, that's, that's, that's a common theme throughout law too I mean if someone in real estate if someone goes on your property and uses it for 20 years and at least in Illinois it can be as short as five or seven they can actually take the property you know it's called adverse possession if someone's not vigilant in defending their property, their ownership of the property, then someone else can come squat on their land and eventually, you know, um, attain ownership through sort of precedent. I've been here, I received mail here for 20 years, and nobody said anything. And it's kind of the same thing in, in a, you know, the Federal Reserve really isn't a constitutionally chartered institution, or even, it's not even, a, it's not even in tune with the, the beliefs of the founding fathers of the Constitution or anything. Our country's been founded on the private central bank. It's been a big battle in our country um, for a long time. How did we end up with the Federal Reserve and why is why why do people have an issue with the Federal Reserve? Well, we, we ended up with the Federal Reserve through the collusion of a group of um, international bankers that had a vested interest in having control over the money supply. Uh, that people have a beef with it once they understand how it works. It's not, it's, it's an essentially a quasi-governmental institution. It's not beholden to the government and it's not answerable to the government. They control our money, but the, um, they don't respond to requests for audits. They're not transparent. They operate in secrecy. Um, 
And if you look at the purchasing power of the dollar, it's lost over 95% of its power since the inception of the Federal Reserve in 1913. So uh, what they're charged with doing is protecting the integrity of our money and controlling it so that depressions and things like that can't happen. Uh, the financial panic of 1907, I think, was actually the, uh, the impetus for the formation of the Federal Reserve. But they exacerbated the uh, Great Depression by contracting the money supply at the beginning uh, um, of the Great Depression, which arguably caused it. I mean, I, I, economists like Milton Friedman and uh, other people, even Ben Bernanke even said, you know, hey, you're right, we caused the Great Depression. Those mistakes. Well, then, how come we have the financial crash of uh, 2008? I think it boils down to they haven't done their job, you know, or at least they haven't done what their uh, stated job is. They haven't succeeded in their stated mission, which is to protect us from these boom bust cycles and protect the integrity of our money. They've exacerbated depressions and eroded the value of the dollar. People that say that the financial crisis of 2007, that that was orchestrated to preempt a reason for the Federal Reserve, do you see any credence to that accusation? 1907 or 2000? 1907. Did you know the establishment yeah, the of the panic, Federal Reserve? It, it's usually orchestrated. I mean, I, I, I can't say um, specifically uh, the, fi you know, the financial panic of 1907. I can say if we go back to the time of uh, Andrew Jackson, uh, that was the time of the second bank in the United States. The Federal Reserve is actually the third central bank the United States has had. At the time of this, um, the second central bank, Jackson, um, his main campaign uh, platform was Jackson and no bank. He was vehemently opposed to central banking. Um, said they were a den of vipers and by the eternal God I will rat you out. So when, um, when Jackson vetoed the bank's charter renewal and they were going to close the bank, uh, Nicholas Biddle removed uh, essentially threatened that if they try to close us down and you don't renew the charter, I'm going to cause a depression. I'm going to call in the loans that we have and I'm not going to make any more new loans. It's going to contract the money supply and cause a depression. That's exactly what they did. So, I mean, I, I can't say for certain, you know, that a lot of these things are always done in secret. Um, but there's a precedent where, you know, someone has openly said, I will do this if, if my business is threatened. And when it was threatened, he followed through on his promise. So I would say it's a, it's a distinct possibility. Now this um, centralized banking system before the Federal Reserve, was that a government system or was it a private system? Because it's always, it's always a private system. Um, and it's usually, I mean, they give, they give them names like Bank of the United States or the Federal Reserve. You know, it, it's complete misnomers. They're not federal, and there's no reserve. Um, Bank of the United States was most of the stock was held by foreign creditors, you know, which is one of the reasons that Jackson didn't like it so much. He felt it gave foreigners an un in undue influence over uh, domestic policy. Now, now there, there's this accusation. Now we've we've talked about how the government uh, bailed out the banks. Um, there's this accusation and evidence that supports the claim that the Federal Reserve. He had a bunch of money, and they did some bails on their own, secretly, yeah, because there was some money unaccounted for. How much? How much money was unaccounted for? And uh, depends on the fig. I mean, if you go by the GAO audit, uh, the, or G, yeah, Government Accountability Audit, it's uh, somewhere like sixteen trillion dollars. Um, and, and sixteen trillion dollars. Uh, how does that com uh, combine to the United States? Uh, um, uh, what is it, uh, gross um, economic... Uh, oh, the GDP? What yeah, is yeah, the UN, GDP. United, what is the U.S. GDP now? I really, I don't know. I'd have I, to check. I mean, 16 trillion is... is it's is, enormous. Is, is, Let's is compare there. it to the, to the TARP bailout. What was the TARP bailout? Like, uh, seven or eight billion dollars? Billion, yeah. And so, here we're talking trillion, which is like... A different order of magnitude. It, it's unfathomable. This money, and uh, if if you're dishing out sixteen trillion dollars to these banks, now now now, what was what was the the government bailout of these banks in comparison to the sixteen trillion? Well, there, there is no real government. A government bailout is a Fed bailout because uh, see, and here's how the system works: instead of the Treasury issuing dollar bills, they 
sell bonds to the Federal Reserve. A bond is like a loan. It's a promise to pay in the future. Um, so they make a promise to pay in the future and the Federal Reserve hits a button and credits their account. They don't have funds to pay for this. They're not buying the bonds. They're buying the bonds with nothing. They're creating money at that moment. So it's like if I had a big sheet of paper and a bunch of IOUs and every time you needed to buy something, you, had to, you know, you had to come to me give me an IOU in order for me to give me give you, you know, a couple uh, dollars which I just tore off the sheet of paper and wrote one dollar on and handed to you. I mean it's essentially no different. It's counterfeiting, there's no real value backing it up. Because there's 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 no production. Uh, and there's no increased production to right, contribute right. to that ratio. There's no, there's no so it's actually depreciating the value of the dollar 16. when they just print out this money and just hand it out, whether it's the federal secretly, reserve. Secretly depreciating the value of the dollar because, you know, some of the value of the dollar is based on euro dollars, which are just, you know, dollars not in America, dollars, and that's the stuff that was getting loaned out. You know, they were loaning out to other European central banks and private banking institutions. And, um, it's a whole lot of money, and like you said, it, it, there's no, the ratio, that's what it's all about. People usually don't understand, that's another uh, major monetary um, theory point that many people miss, is there's a finite amount of value that has to do with production, and then there's a finite number of dollars, and the production is cut up into, you know, as, many, as however many pieces as there are dollars. So if you double the amount of dollars, you, you, you have, you know, each one is a smaller slice of the pie. Now, it looks like that this is affecting the middle class with the argument that the majority of the money is going to what the Occupy movement is popularizing as the 1%. That's happening in two ways. I mean, most of the people with uh, large ownership interests in these financial institutions or the executives working at those financial institutions would qualify as one percenters. And through inflating the money supply, um, there's a lag effect with inflation. When you do pour a bunch more, you know, it takes time for things to regain equilibrium and, you know, for the dollar to find its new, new value. Um, so the people that get that money first have the uh, advantage of being able to spend it at its current present value. Right, talk about trickle-down economics. When it finally trickles down and makes it to the, the working man, it's depreciated. So his $10 not only buys nine fifty worth of goods. So inflation does hurt the middle class and the poor more since they are the last ones to get the money. You know, it goes to it goes to financial institutions which lend it to corporations and corporations, you know, deposit it to banks which free lend it out. Like like I'm saying, by the time it gets back to the little guy, you know, several steps down the line when the, the, those employers pay them, it goes to the bank, it comes out of the bank, you take it out. It's lost a lot of uh, it's lost a lot of its value by them. There's this argument that by these bailouts, and, and it's a mainstream argument that with the trickle down economics, as you said, that um, it's actually going to benefit the middle class and benefit the economy. What is wrong with that view? I mean, uh, a lot of people have a problem with that, and, and that problem is becoming popular, but still, the mainstream media is pushing it. Mainstream media, you know, everyone's interconnected and stands to benefit from the status quo. I don't see how taking money from the people and rewarding financial institutions for making bad decisions in any way enriches or helps the people. You know, um, the argument is that these corporations with these bailouts, they will be able to invest that money to more well, they're not production. Doing, they're not higher. doing that. I mean, at least the record hasn't shown that they're doing that. They're not. That is a claim, you know, and they will often do that. You know, just we're going to reach full employment. We're going to reach full employment. Is there any checks and balance with these uh, with these loans and balance? I mean, I, I, no, because I, obviously with yeah. the Federal Reserve, there's there's no there's, accountability. You know, that, that's one of the things the GAO audit revealed: just a complete lack of uh, checks and balances, um, numerous conflicts of interest. It's kind of a revolving door between Wall Street, the Treasury, and uh, the people the people that work there. Uh, Tim Geithner, uh, Hank Paulson, those people of you know Goldman and Lehman and all the other the big Wall Street banking houses, and then they get a position in the Treasury, and it's like a good old boys club. Um, so yeah, they're going to proffer arguments that, that sound good on their face, but I mean it, they either don't do what they say they're going to do, or um, if you really investigate the actual effects, I mean they they may state that. Uh, 
doing, you know, the bailing us out is going to save these jobs. And, you know, we need to save these jobs because the unemployment's already high. Um, yeah, it will save those jobs, but it also takes a lot, of, you know, it also puts a, a debt burden on the entire, you know, they don't, they don't look at the whole picture. That's what it, they, they, they do a, a very myopic do they, analysis. Do they not look at the big picture because the public is not looking at the big picture? Well, no, they look at the big picture. They know the big picture. They, the they, public? They show, no, the, the banks know the big okay. picture. They, they, they know the big picture. They present a myopic. I mean, you know, you could say, I, I wonder who really knows what's going on. But if, but if I know some of these things, and some people I know also know these things, I would figure people who have been doing this for their you know, livelihood know these things as well. Um, so it, it seems like this picture that, that the mainstream media and the government, uh, it, that, that it's in a way that they take advantage of people's ignorance, that they only satisfy the, the, uh, the, um, the spectrum of the status quo of what people are capable of understanding, or, or not capable of understanding, everybody's capable of understanding the big picture, but of what their awareness level is. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I think... Uh... I think even entertainment media um, and uh, the well, educational, yeah, the educational system. Like I said, you know, you're not gonna if you want to learn about economics and you want to learn about monetary policy, you know, you either have to go to college and hope you get a good professor, or you have to do it on your own, you know, because they're not gonna provide that knowledge. And then the entertainment industry, like you said, is a distraction. Um, People, people are more worried about keeping up with the Kardashians and keeping up with monetary policy or, you know, what's going on in the Middle East or anything like that. So, yeah, I think it's engineered. Um, so, so what, what, what do you, you have two choices. Either you find a good professor or you learn on your own. What makes a good professor and what do you need to know to be able to learn on your own? Because obviously the, the, the schools, I mean, most schools in the education, they don't teach you how to learn on your own. They just feed you. I mean, is that your consensus? I would, I would tend to agree with that. I didn't, I didn't do very well in the school system um, by traditional metrics. I mean, I, I somewhat, I did well on tests, but I, I, I've always been like a self-learning type of uh, autodidactic type of person. So, what was feeding that self-learning? I mean, uh, what was it that that uh, that pushed you to learn on your own as opposed to being maybe cognitive dissonance, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, checking, uh, you know, like what I what I'm being told and what I'm seeing are two different things here. I mean, I, I guess there's a certain that's maybe what you have to look for. Um, the discrepancies. Yeah. And I hate to use common sense as a word, but I mean, you do have a, a, a nervous system in your gut that does give you feedback, your enteric nervous system. So you need to like really feel stay, it out. Feel it out, yeah, feel it out. Uh, trust, trust yourself and your instincts. And if something seems overly technical, it usually is. Um, you read Keynes, uh, the, the, m most modern economists uh, go back to uh, John Maynard Keynes with the general theory of money and interest. It's, it's, it's a tome of a book, and it is, it is just immensely, con I can't follow it. I, I lost interest almost immediately because it's just so Byzantine that it, there's no possible way that you, know, you can form any sort of conceptual framework because it's just so highly technical. It's, you know, or it's, 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 it's obtusified, right? Would that be the word? It's one of them. It's a Over, or yeah. obfuscated. Yeah. Obfuscated. I feel it uh, jargonized is another one I like. You know, jargon has three def or three definitions. One is trade language. One is language used among you know uh, a specific group of people. Those two kind of mean the same thing. I like the third one. It means gibberish or bullshit. Right. So um, now, 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 <laughs> now, 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 that's probably different than, than say like people like Nietzsche <laughs> that intentionally didn't jargonize it, but made the, the structure of the language complicated where it would only reach a certain per, uh, uh, portion of the population uh, that was at a level of understanding that they wouldn't uh, that they wouldn't attack uh, that philosopher or, or, or the person that that was like their protective insulation oh from uh from yeah from the given from, from the mainstream <laughs> you know from being like from, said, from the powers from that be which are manipulating in, the mainstream like uh, the Marquis de Sade or something like that so, 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 what are the qualities to look for in, in what makes a good professor? What is conducive to a student's learning environment? 
I as think far as a teacher is concerned. Uh, discuss this with a couple people here. You know, we talked about teaching people how to learn instead of pe teaching people what to think, or teaching people how to think rather than what to think. Um, critical thinking, being able to evaluate arguments for their soundness, being able to sniff out BS. That's a that's a skill that I think it isn't taught or isn't focused on enough or isn't should be taught more directly as a life skill. Uh, I, 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 despite what everyone says about never using that stuff, have used a lot of things that I learned in school. Um, but I think critical thinking would have been uh, much more beneficial. I would use that every day. I do use it every day. Rupert Murdoch has taken the position that the public schools are failing, and he's taken the privatization aspect of technology. What that sounds like to me is less teachers and putting students in front of computers. Uh, is that an appropriate response to take what, to have less teachers and, and, and more computers? Is technology the answer? Well, that that question's kind of a double bind, but I, I'll say that yes and no. More computers is good because we live in a, in a world with more computers, um, and school should teach people how to live in the world we live in. Uh, as far as less teachers, I don't think that's good. That's a way. I mean, if you're going to privatize something and stick people in front of computers, that's a way to increase revenue, um, if that's your goal. But I don't think I don't think it's very. Uh, I don't think it's fair to put that those kind of incentives in education. The goal should be to educate the person, and you need human human interaction to do that. Or people. Right. I, I would agree <laughs> that human to human interaction is 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 a part of our ability to connect with each other and to have that critical thinking uh, uh, ability. Uh, when you're pushed in front of a computer and you're learning from the computer, that's a more controlled environment. And if it's a private entity that's doing that, it's even more propagandish, or at least it has that potential. It may not appear that from the beginning when they're selling the idea. That's often how it is. But and that's been just demonstrated in history with privatization, hasn't it? A lot of times. Now, it's hard, it's difficult for me because I'm a big free market advocate and I'm sort of an advocate for uh, privatization in a lot of circumstances. Um, but privatization has to go along with competition. Like if you take uh, an education, for example, if you take education, for example, and you want to privatize it, that's fine. But don't hand over monopoly rights to, to Rupert Murdoch and let him run stuff, because that's not private. Well, it, it, I mean, it's private in the sense that Rupert Murdoch is running it, but it's not It's not uh, open for competition. Other people can't get it's, into business. It's, it's, it's not true. Uh, true. Um, well, it's an oligarchy. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> I mean, you know, so I mean, if you're going to take a... Uh, it is. If you, if, if, you want, if you want competition in economics to work in a capitalistic system, it's got to be true capitalism. And what is true capitalism and what do we have right now? I mean, in taking the evolutionary model of capitalism, uh, yeah. what is wrong with uh, the capitalism? Do we have capitalism? Well, I mean, we call it capitalism? I wouldn't... I, w I mean... We use capital and capitalism. I mean, the capitalist capitalism is really just a market economy, as I see it. I mean, it's a capitalism free I, free market. Yeah, right? free market economy. I well, capitalism's acquired a lot of negative connotations, which have to do with the structure of what you know how how things are how capitalism or how our economy is set up in the United States. We'll call it more crony capitalism or a, a mild oligarchy. I mean, <laughs> is, 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 is this crony capitalism because uh, there's a conflict of interest uh, that um, uh, between the corporations and the government that uh, that shouldn't be there? I think I, I feel that that's the root of the issue. That there's that conflict there, where you know there's an influence of government with corporations, and then they're, they're, and rumors, then they're using yeah. using that as an argument to to replace. The government was something private, saying that the government's failing, the government's corrupt, but it's actually being corrupted by uh, private interest. Well, once again, I mean, I'm I'm all for privatization. I mean, as long as you allow a free market to function, 
and and your what we call that the, the relationship that you're describing between uh, government and corporations they call it a perverse incentive you know it's an incentive to act in an immoral way a way that doesn't benefit society um, you got to be careful like you're talking about privatizing the water or the parking meters I mean in some sort of sense those are natural monopolies we don't you know there's one place on the street you can't have four part four four meter companies um, competing against each other in a localized area right and just like the water supply that's like uh or that's, the power that's supply. That's juridical uh, monopolies. You, you might have different, different corporations George? and like different... Are you talking, referring to Henry George? Um, I'm not familiar with that, but, but I'm just saying uh, you can have a monopoly in a specific area, but that doesn't mean that's the only company doing that service uh, in, in the country or in, in, in a larger well, area. They call those natural monopolies, like we were saying, with water or power, where the nature of infrastructure used to deliver the service uh, limits the amount of businesses that can into it. I mean, you know, four sets of power lines, are, that's redundant. Um, you have one set of power lines and one company that controls the delivery of power. I mean, there's even, they're successful. They have somewhat deregulated the power industry and privatized it. We've seen the amount of green energy and sustainable energy um, being used go up, and we've seen consumer electricity prices um, come down. You know, people are coming together in groups aggregating and buying their power from companies that offer better prices, uh, a more sustainable business model, or both. So privatization can work, but um, privatization doesn't mean, uh, it means allowing the market to function. Right. The market's supposed to test new ideas and it's supposed to be you know, it's the most there, there, there's an element there between the government and, and the private sector that's corrupting the free market. And that's 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 what most of the problems with the evil corporations and capitalism. I think that they occupy because they're they're allowed to lobby or like pay lobbyists to foot to foot their bill um, and to, to offer incentives to different politicians that are swayed their way. Yeah, it has to do with the nature of the corporate charter as well. You know, they don't have to prove that they're doing any benefit. They have a uh, responsibility to solely seek an increase in you know, uh, shareholder value. So, 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 so we've gone from the homeowner market uh, issue to the privatization corruption issue with government. Now there's also the international market with outsourcing. And that's also a major issue that has impacted our economy. Why has that impacted our economy? I mean, one of the countries that comes to mind first is China. And then you, with tech support, you've got India, and Bangladesh, and these, these once third world, world countries. I mean, we call them third world countries because, because that's, that's what the United States is categorizing. But there's other different qualities that I think better describe the value of a country than just the financial aptitude. There is, but I mean, or the capital appetite. Referring to the the globalization, and uh, I mean, some of it has to do with just um, the uh, differential in, in costs in labor markets. I mean, we're talking about outsourcing labor. India has the labor available um, in their economy, and because of the difference in in values in that uh, currency and the purchasing power. And, you know, differences in their economy, it's cheaper for us to hire over there, even, you know, if you take into account the uh, logistics involved with outsourcing. There's also the argument that not only are they more willing to work in these other countries, but they have a more stringent uh, work ethic and aptitude as well. Do you think that's the case? I mean, are, is, is the United States kind of like stumbling? Might be true in some circumstances. I think we've lost our way, you know, philosophically, morally.
a lot of what I say could actually you know, be interpreted as you know pro-republican or pro-1%. I'm not for minimum wage laws, I'm not for um, maximum work weeks, you know, I'm I, uh, Like, uh, screw the limits and let the free market do its thing. That's what I say. I mean, you know, some of some of these some of these things we've um, setting a setting a, a high minimum wage is actually going to cause jobs to go overseas. That makes sense. I mean, companies have a have an incentive to increase profits for shareholders if they can, you know, uh, cut their costs by hiring well, cheaper well, labor. Why wouldn't they do that? You know, I was in India in 2004, and the cost of living there they don't have property taxes on a lot of the stuff that they sell. The only time you have a pro the only time you have a tax on anything is if you make a very big expenditure, like in a house or a car. And yeah, luxury taxes. Yeah. yeah, luxury taxes. Value added. Here, yeah. we're taxing. Uh, there, there's an, uh, there, there's what, what most people are considering an unfair distribution of taxing. It's like big corporations that are making a lot of money are not being taxed, where poor people are being taxed the same as, say, middle-class people. I mean, it, it goes a little deeper than that, too, if you think about it. A wage earner, you, know, you fill out your W-2 form, and they take money out of your check. Every paycheck, they take your taxes out of check, so you, they, you're you allowed to spend the net after tax. Um, a corporation, a lot of times, the reason they don't pay any taxes is because, you know, they, they, they lost money last year and they're able to carry over that loss, or um, or they're able to write off a bunch of their things because corporations are allowed to spend money and they're taxed on what's left over. That's that's a factor that that uh, you know for like the homeowner and just like the cost of living in this country, that may be the reason for why we have minimum wage laws is to be able to have a viable, sustainable cost of living uh, for 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 people. Um, what are some of the elements? That, I, I mean, I came over the. The property tax issue, and there's the idea of having an allodial title that most people aren't even aware of. There's, um, yeah, there's no, there's no real, there's no true allodial title really anywhere in the world except the Scandinavia. You basically have to declare yourself a, not a citizen or not a tax, not, not not a tax. Yeah. Not a property of the IRS, so to speak. If you really study the language, you, you know, the once, you, once you sign that tax form, you are the property of the IRS. Right. You have to be careful, though. You know, don't go doing that because you get labeled as a domestic terrorist and sent to a content management or communications management. Unit. But yeah, that's the whole like sovereign citizen movement, redemption. And, uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily opposed to some property taxes. I'm not opposed to all taxes, but the system of taxation, aside from the fact that. Uh, I would think the two most insidious elements are the fact that we're tax we we ta we're, uh, we're taxed before we spend and corporations are taxed after they spend. You know, and the second one is inflation, which I kind of you know, got into earlier, the trickle down thing where you know the people that get the money direct from the bank spend it at its current value, and by the time it gets to you and I. It's worth, you know, 10%, 7%, however, you know, many percent less compounded over several years. You know, people don't think about it, but if they're taking, if they're eroding the value of your dollar, they're taxing you. That's a tax. And <laughs> you're paying for it because you can only buy one 95 cents. One of the issues I think people are going to have uh, that is still unanswered is that there's a lot of supporters of minimum wage. Now, I would agree that in a system the way it should be, uh, that uh, that we shouldn't have to have those um, those uh, those those laws that that everybody should be able to benefit in their own right in this free market system. Why do we have to have these laws? I mean, I mean, are, what is what is creating the precedents for minimum wage laws? People like it, um, and because. Uh, a lot of times economic um, consequences, the unintended consequences, are counterintuitive. People don't think that a minimum wage would create unemployment. Um, but consider the fact that a company really can't afford to pay someone who only produces $6 an hour worth of, um, you know, only make $6 an hour worth of productivity. They can't afford to pay that person $8.50 an hour if the minimum wage is $8.50 an hour. So that person goes unemployed. Um, or 
they have to lay off people because they have to pay them. Like I said, they have to pay them more than they're worth. Or um, could there be a solution to this? Because there is like individual sovereignty and individual rights. That if the person wants to work for less money, that they sign a waiver. Is there anything like that? Or if there isn't, should there be? Not that I know of, but I think there should be, or I think we should just repeal the laws. I mean, like I said, it's counterintuitive to think, you know, they're trying to increase the standard of living, but by creating unemployment, um, they're actually going to decrease the standard of living and increase the burden on people who still have jobs. They'll, they'll raise the minimum wage, create some unemployment, and then raise taxes to take care of those people that are unemployed. So you end up with a whole mess and then every step of the way you go to try and further remedy the situation, more corrective action, more unintended consequences. That's 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 really the beauty of the free market system. So I would say remove it all together. Uh, the beauty of the free market is anytime um, there's an action that takes it out of dis disequilibrium, there's usually a corrective action that almost it's an automatic feedback process. So you're not going to see wages dip and slave, you know, you're not going to see slave labor uh, you're not going to see Upton Sinclair if we repeal the minimum wage law. Uh, that's what people fear, and it's an easy answer to say, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. It's good campaign promises. Now, one of the things that uh, we've discussed off camera that inspires me a lot, and that I can connect with a lot, is that the way you live is more spontaneous than planned. Uh, why do you think that is a valuable uh, quality of, of living? There's so much uncertainty in life that if you try and plan everything out and expect uh, everything to go according to plan, you're bound to be disappointed. Um, now, now there's spontaneity that is um, basically not relevant to reality, and that creates problems. Your sp spontaneity is more based on in the moment reaction to situations. And I, what I mean by situations is like opportunities, incentives, and maybe obstacles. Let's try to re remain adaptable. As the pace of change exponentially increases in the world we live in, it makes less and less san sense to um, try and make long-term plans. It becomes increasingly hard to predict the future as entropy increases. You know. <laughs> Do you think that's like the fault of the free market system is that people are planning things ahead of time and in some way that's controlling things? That if we lived in a system, a free market, where we're more spun, where we're, 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 we're more in the moment, that decisions are made based on uh, future conditions? See, that's the trick though, is like, you have to, you have to try to plan. You have to make your, in business at least, you have to make your educated, you know, best guess and then test your assumptions. Um, I think it's more, I mean, I guess I would have to, to answer that question, I would have to separate the big corporations and government that we've already just discussed are pretty much, you know, colluding to achieve um, ends they're benefiting from one another. And then there's the innovative, um, new companies, new tech companies, and startups, and stuff like that. Uh, one of the developing trends with those innovative new tech startup companies, which I think are more representative of a free market as it's meant to function, um, is that the uh, business plans need to be more adaptable. You need to have a plan Z, you know, and, and ways to scientifically test your assumptions against reality, be more in the moment, more responsive, more in touch, more interactive, taking uh, feedback from your employees and your customers. Yeah, long-term planning and then trying to make reality conform with your plan when it doesn't match up could cause some distortions and problems. There, some people are trapped in the box of the United States. Now, if we have the corporations colluding with the government, and the government is focused mostly on, I mean, they should be focused on the security of the United States and its people. Domestic issues, right. right. Corporations are international. Are, are, are their interests invested in the well-being of the United States? <sighs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, they could they go anywhere they want. Stateless the creatures, yeah. Um, and here, we run into a number of pickles, like what? A, in an international company, we talk about the monetary system and outsourcing and, and uh, globalization and 
taking jobs overseas. And They'll go like wherever that. the money is. Yeah. Well, yeah, some of that has to do with if we had a freer market and less restrictions, it would be a more advantageous. You know, it, it would be, it wouldn't save as much money if there weren't as many impediments or, you know, they, they, they take their profits elsewhere because the tax, the tax environment there is more friendly. But I mean, yeah, the, the system of government and big corporations are all, all stand to benefit from the way things currently operate. Do you think it's going to kick them in the ass later in life? You know, the, the government officials and, 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 and maybe some of the people that are pulling the strings. I'm not saying the people that are all at the top, but the people that are actually involved in it. That they're like you said with like the boiler, the, the the movie the boiler room where they're getting all this money, they're still trapped in this box. They're not seeing the big picture. They're not seeing that they're going over the cliff. Do you think that's a reality? Absolutely. Yeah. I think. What's the what, what was what was the they raised the debt ceiling? I don't remember the exact number, but um, it was like under twenty trillion. I know that they. Uh, we also have an additional 81 or 88 trillion in unfunded liabilities. You know, we don't count what we're going to owe for Social Security in the next 15, 20 years. I mean, we're bust. We're bankrupt, essentially, if you look in a, in a long term. Thing. There's really no way we could ever, ever repay all our outstanding debt without debasing the currency so much that it would be valueless. There's, there's this movement right now that's saying, let's, tra let's tax uh, investment transactions. Is that a viable solution? It's a disincentive to invest. People need returns now. Now, now. If, it, if it's a small percentage, it's like 0.05 percent, uh, it still work. Well, I mean, it's less of a disincentive. I mean, the the, 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 the higher the tax rate, the more of an impediment it is. Um, so I guess the issue is that if you start taxing, even if it's a small uh, amount, that if you institute that that policy that there's always that potential and fear that that tax will increase. Yeah, it'll self-perpetuate. I mean, you know, it takes Social Security. I mean, that's a, that's a tax in a sense. I mean, we're supposed to get it back. The Social Security Trust was never fully funded. Congress spent the money as it came in and then increased the benefits once again for their political constituencies and special interest groups. You know, you want to get the senior votes, you throw Medicare and the Social Security. And you defray costs, you know, you defer the cost to the... Uh, to the future. And then when the future comes, you fulfill more promises and put off payment a little further. But eventually, this giant mountain of debt, you, know, you can't keep uh, you end up with uh, 10 pounds and a 5 pound bag. And uh, it's going to spill out. And, you know, it'll bite everyone. But, you know, no, no, no. It's especially dangerous because the dollar is the reserve currency of the world still. I mean, we've been downgraded, but a lot of uh, the value of the dollar is propped up by the demand for the dollar. That means that people, since it's not backed by anything, it means people have faith in the country. So right now, people still have more faith in America than they do in, you know, brand America than they do in brand Eurozone. Do you think we still need that faith, even though it's false faith, in order to keep things going and have that as a do you think a temporary thing until we come up with a solution? Are you I asking mean, me if I think denial is a better policy? <laughs> oh, probably not. I mean, there's 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 there's, there's definitely some dishonesty, yeah. uh, right. and, and, and the element of dishonesty is. So, is, is it better to do justify the dishonesty? Yeah, is it better is it better to uh, is it better to, to to lie to the public for the benefit of the monetary system? I would say that 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 uh, creates a tendency for people in a position to take advantage of that to do so. Gotcha. Um, so you can try, you know, in the best interest of people to, to, to you know, cover their eyes. But like. any any time you're being dishonest, even if it's to the benefit temporarily to the people, it's also being a benefit to the people who... It, it, it can be a benefit temporarily to the people in the sense that, you know, we don't want to tell this dude he has cancer because it'll scare the crap out of him. But, you know, when he's terminal and he starts, you know, uh, retaining wander and jaundicing up and his kidneys shut down, he's going to be pissed that you didn't tell him because he couldn't even get treatment. You know, that's, that's so the real thing. So it seems like we're going to know the devastation when we're in the devastation. Yeah, yeah, and, and we never and that's And that's what they're going to tell us. They're not going to tell us what's coming. Well, I mean, they probably won't even tell us then. They'll, they'll yeah. give us their, their spun version of it that, that makes them less culpable. Um, they'll blame it on something, someone else. So what are you doing for dinner tonight? Hmm. I think, uh, 
I think you're roasting that filet. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Yeah. So it should be, it should be very tender and delicious. Yeah. So if I, I think we did something juicy here. Yeah. We'll, we'll eat something juicy. Well, sounds thank you, good. Chuck. Thanks, Chuck. Right. Anytime.